young people without homes find a refuge from the streets and an underserved community finds new hope for health services in a recovering hospital. Washington Full Circle starts right now. Being homeless is hard enough, but for a youth struggling without food or shelter, it can be devastating. For 20 years now, Covenant House Washington has been opening its doors and providing a lifeline to so many of those young people. Dr. Marty Henson is president and CEO of Covenant House Washington. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me today. Now, first of all, how, how great a problem is the issue of homeless teens and young people in D.C. itself? Uh, it is uh, still a tremendous problem. Uh, and as we understand the affordability of living in this wonderful region is making it even more difficult for young people and others to live here. And so homelessness is a growing issue here in the nation's capital. What do you think is the main cause for uh, homelessness in youth? So homelessness and youth are coming from many reasons and so sometimes people speculate but the reality of it is that we have young people with us and sometimes that is because they've aged out of the foster care program. Mm -hmm. um, there are times when just because of the culture of their own family who says you're 18 now, you're a man, it's time to be out on your own and from those of us that have 18 year olders mm -hmm. we know that that really is, cannot be further from the truth. Right. We have young people that have made some poor choices in their life and unfortunately have found themselves there and then we also have those young people that have been lured to the streets uh, and then find themselves without a place to stay. Now how do they find out about Covenant House so that you have these open doors for them? You know the the, the biggest ambassadors uh, for Covenant House are the youth themselves. Uh, we have been in this community for 20 years. Over those 20 years, Covenant House has served more than 35,000 youth. Wow. More than 1,000 youth come in through our doors at our Southeast campus annually. Mm -hmm. And so when talking about where their support services, uh, youth actually are one of those biggest ambassadors about spread, spreading the word about who we are. I see. Mm -hmm. Now, so uh, as far as first you give them shelter, mm -hmm. uh, food, whatever, mm -hmm. but uh, that's not the end of it. You want to make sure that they can do what? Yes. So Covenant House actually is a very comprehensive, holistic organization. Uh, we are about transforming the life of young people that are homeless or disconnected. So at our campus, not only do we have housing for those young people that may be homeless, we also have education services, job readiness services, I have one of the few gold-tiered, nationally accredited uh, child development centers there on campus. And we provide services for after school and out of school for middle school to high school youth. So there are many services that are there to support youth that are having challenges, whether they're disconnected from home, from school, or from work. Now, do you also find that there are young people uh, who actually have young children already that, that show up at your doorstep? Well, many of them, and, and, and as I mentioned, you know, sometimes there are choices that young people have made, uh, and sometimes that is you found yourself now pregnant or with a baby, and there are families who then, unfortunately, that young person is out on the street. Mm -hmm. So where is it that they are to go with a young baby? So at our housing units, which we have emergency housing, as well as transitional longer term housing, we do have moms and babies that are there. Uh, for young people that are near, I would say, homeless, that we're working to help make sure they don't get there, where we're putting them back into school, where we're helping them with jobs. We also have the Child Development Center because if you get back on that track, mm -hmm. you've got to have a safe, nurturing, uh, educational environment for your young uh, baby to be at. And so we're very proud of that as well. So yes. Yeah. Now, speaking of education, mm -hmm. uh, this year you're focused on the GED uh, mm -hmm. high school diplomas. Mm -hmm. What's that all about and what does it mean? All right. So we are focused on education. Um, I am even having been formerly an administrator and a school administrator. So mm -hmm. education is incredibly important and has always been for Covenant House. Uh, if you look at our last fiscal year, actually 30 percent of all the 18 to 24 year olds in D.C. that got a GED earned it through Covenant House. 
Uh, and so after that, the actual instrument itself tra changed. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very rigorous. It is common core standard. And so it meant starting over again, and that's where we are working with those young persons to get through that process. Education is another gateway to move out of the ability to not take care of yourself. So we are very serious about making sure that our young people are connected there those that go on and and are those that even come to us with a high school diploma and mm -hmm. still find themselves uh, without other supportive services or housing we help them to get into post-secondary into college as well as to other credential programs as well now you're doing an awful lot at covenant house mm -hmm. washington by yourself yeah. but how can the community help in, in with this issue so let me just say it is not by ourselves <laughs> <laughs> You can't do this by ourselves. Uh, we provide a good framework, a good infrastructure uh, for that to happen. Uh, I have great staff that's working there from certified teachers uh, to counselors and case managers, but we need the community. Uh, and just looking at our volunteer list, we've had over 500 volunteers that have been in to work and to support us. We need mentors and tutors. We need those who want to come in, in fact, to just help us with you know, some of the services that we have or just volunteer for the day to serve a meal. Uh, we served 58,000 meals last year Wow! <laughs> to hungry people. So there are lots of ways for the community to come in either physically to be there to suffer and clearly we always need additional financial support to help ensure that we're having quality programs and we can move forward. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, congratulations for 20 years of doing good things in the city, and I wish you well in the future. Thanks well, so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having us here All today. Right. When we return, a mobile strategy to bring health care to the city's underserved community. Stay with us. Washington Full Circle will be right back. Welcome back to Washington Full Circle. Residents east of the river have long suffered the highest rate of chronic health conditions, yet they also suffered the least access to health services. Today, a once ailing hospital in their community is undergoing a turnaround and urging patients to take a second look. David Small is the CEO of the United Medical Center and he joins us here today. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me here. Now, before we talk about what you're doing with the hospital, how great is the need for good health services in Ward 7 and 8? I assume that's what we're talking about. Well, the need is tremendous. Uh, before the hospital embarked on creating a new strategic plan two years ago, we did a full community needs assessment, and what we found was astonishing. Uh, we knew that there were serious levels of chronic illnesses, uh, largely due to lack of access to health care, but what we didn't realize quite fully was that the residents of Ward 7 and 8 in particular were overly high utilizers of health care, but in the wrong place at the wrong time. Inpatient care, uh, where uh, really the need is, uh, is great, emergency room emergency care, room, yes. largely because of lack of access to primary, urgent care, and wellness care. And we set about developing a strategic plan that not only met their emergent episodic need, but also trying to deal with uh, the needs to keep them healthy, get them healthy before they have to use a hospital. Now, part of that plan was what two things? What were the two major strategic things you needed to do right away? Well, first and foremost, it was to stabilize the hospital operations from the standpoint of ensuring that we had the right levels of service with the right uh, levels of competent staff, nursing care, uh, physician care, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we went about stabilizing that and with the district's help with an infusion of money, we were able to make a successful turnaround uh, in terms of operations of the hospital, improving quality, uh, improving the efficiency of services provided, improving the safety of the environment of healthcare. Mm -hmm. The second thing, and equally as important, 
was to start to develop a network of ambulatory care delivery in much greater fashion than what had existed previously. Now what does that mean, ambulatory service delivery? Ambulatory is outpatient care. Mm -hmm. And when I say outpatient care, we were really focused on how to keep people out of an emergency room and inpatient beds. So you look at programs that are designed to help screen and assess for illness, particularly chronic illnesses, mm -hmm. uh, to link people to the appropriate primary care, hopefully out in the community or even on the hospital's campus in our clinics, and to get people to the right level of care at the right time so that it's dealt with efficiently, effectively, and certainly from a patient satisfaction standpoint uh, uh, that meets their particular needs and convenience of it. Now, one of those things you, you're doing uh, with the hospital now is this mobile uh, medical center. Tell us about that. Yes. Well, one of the things that we found was that um, people came to the hospital, but they usually came to the hospital at the most dire uh, part of, of illness or a desire that said, I know I need to be treated and I have nowhere else to go. Uh, we took seriously the words of an old song taking it to the streets. <laughs> we really felt that we needed to distribute health care right into the neighborhoods and communities where people are, where they live, where they work, where they reside. Um, and we found uh, that in this age of new consumerism, patients want to receive health care when it's convenient for them. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with bricks and mortar and move buildings. So we embarked on a strategy, not necessarily new across the country, but certainly uh, a little bit uh, newer uh, to the district. And that was providing for uh, a rolling medical clinic, if you will, uh, a large, well-outfitted uh, vehicle, uh, and actually there'll be two of them, to take healthcare and healthcare providers into neighborhoods to serve people where they are conveniently and get them into care, screening, diagnoses, urgent care, before they have to take a trip to the hospital itself. So this mobile, uh, machine, mobile uh, medical center would be doing exams, checkups, things like that, but what kind of procedures uh, would happen on that bus, if, in, if any? Well, um, it, it'll be limited to primary and urgent care. Mm -hmm. So the kinds of things that um, uh, you would do in a doctor's office, right. uh, where you're going for screening, for diagnostic work, uh, where you're getting a checkup, where you may have a, uh, a low grade fever and uh, an earache and you wanna have somebody take a look and see what you need to take, the, to take care of that, mm -hmm. we'll be doing those kinds of things. Um, most importantly, based on the screening and the diagnostic work that's done and the intervention with the provider, we'll determine not only what the person needs today, but what they may need going forward. So as an example, if someone comes in not feeling too well, they're a diabetic patient and they've gotten a little off their schedule, um, we can help them with that, but also link them and make sure that they have the right uh, ongoing education, the right interventions to keep them on the steady path to wellness while they have a diabetic condition of chronic need. And how will you get the information out to residents about this mobile uh, device and, and how often it'll be coming in their neighborhoods? Well, uh, we are putting together a schedule, and as one could imagine, uh, the demand for the use <laughs> and having the, uh, the van in people's neighborhoods is, is, is already quickly oversubscribing the, the calendar, <laughs> which is why the second van has been ordered and on the way, which we hope to have in, in about two months' time. Uh, but folks can turn around, they can call the hospital uh, directly, uh, they can um, look at our website uh, where we'll be posting the schedule uh, so that um, uh, folks can see when it's in their neighborhood, um, uh, what times, and how to avail themselves of that. We also will be uh, clearly promoting that in, in various ways uh, through the media. Uh, folks can look at our uh, social media and, and be uh, connected as well. Very good. There's more to talk about. More on the turnaround of United Medical Center when we return. Washington Full Circle will be right back.
Welcome back to Washington Full Circle. We're here with David Small, CEO of United Medical Center. Now, part of this strategic plan to turn around uh, UMC involves partnerships, uh, partnerships with communities and, and others. Tell us about that. Well, uh, it, it's very, very clear that for health care to be effective and for all of us to raise the level of health status in our communities, it's more than a one person, one organization role. And no matter how big a single organization is, um, it's, it's simply not effective. You need to do these things in partnership for the region, uh, uh, for the, the residents who are in our region. So having said that, it's the hospital strategy to ensure uh, that we take full advantage partnering and linking up with all of the existing resources that, ex uh, that are in the community now, mm -hmm. helping to promote and grow new ones. So as an example, the hospital uh, represents services in many respects that can only be done on a hospital campus. Yet there are many other interventions and um, uh, activities with patients that need to be done and can be done outside a hospital. There are many other providers, mm -hmm. physicians' offices, neighborhood communities, urgent care centers, and the like, uh, that we are very interested in ensuring that we have the opportunity to link, to integrate, and collaborate around what's now commonly called population health. Mm -hmm. How do we look at a population, what its needs are, and deliver a collaboration of care that's most effective and efficient? Now, lately we're hearing a lot of talk about Howard University. Uh, tell us about that potential partnership. Is that what that's all about? Well, um, in um, uh, 2013, when our strategic plan was developed and endorsed by the mayor's office and the council at the time, uh, it indicated very clearly that the future of United Medical Center um, could only be best ensured as uh, moving that hospital from a standalone situation to one of part of an integrated delivery of care uh, with a larger healthcare enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, so the hospital and its board set out and trying to find that appropriate partner. Um, after examining a number of proposals that came in, one was presented to then Mayor Gray and the board, the hospital uh, entered into a letter of intent uh, to explore a partnership that included uh, Paladin uh, Healthcare Consulting, um, a uh, group that runs hospitals out of California. Uh, in partnership with Howard University. The thought being that in this unique public-private uh, enterprise, we could in fact develop an integrated delivery of care system using the growing strength um, and resurgence of United Medical Center, uh, the resources that Howard University Hospital has at its disposal, mm -hmm. such as a trauma center, and uh, the strength of Howard University as an academic center, along with the know-how of Paladin, uh, to form uh, the kind of healthcare enterprise uh, that would provide for the long-term needs of the residents of Wards 7 and 8 in nearby Prince George's County. Now, as far as the hospital itself, it's, it's all about equipment and people. How have the people changed within the hospital? What are you doing different than what uh, happened before? Well, uh, there, there are a few things. Uh, first and foremost, it was about holding up the mirror to our staff and saying, here's the current situation. And the current situation was that our residents need a lot of service. They expect a lot of competent service at the time that they want to receive it. They want to see quality and they want to see that there is a focus of attention on customer focused, satisfying care. We held that up to the staff and said, this is what we're about, this is what we wish to be, and we all unified around that, and the entire hospital staff committed to doing that. And we put a program in place to ensure that everybody's job description clearly articulated how their role helped promote what the hospital was about and, and um, uh, move forward with that. We train staff, trained managers, have a very real focus with real-time data to tell everybody how we're doing and organize accordingly. The second big thing we did was to ensure we had the right staff with the right competencies available to meet patient needs at the right time. So we hired more staff, we've invested in staff development, and deploying those staff to meet when and where the patient's conditions dictate. Now, speaking of the patients, I, I read that you met early on with the community members and mm -hmm. there was a lady you said that said uh, the United Medical Center was someplace you went to die. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that and tell us how 
attitudes have changed if you're out with the public and, yes. and you hear back from them. Yes, and, and you can imagine that um, <laughs> as the new CEO at the time, that took me back a little bit. And uh, I know we asked the, the, the follow-up question and said, what, what does that mean? And she said, uh, in effect, uh, my spin on what she said was that UMC was seen as the hospital of last resort. I wouldn't go there um, uh, unless it was the only place I, uh, I, that was available to me. And most of the time, it was to go and die. Um, and, and that was a very sad commentary. Uh, it told us that we needed to increase access at the right time, as we've talked about previously, and provide quality customer-focused care in a way that patients need, demand, and quite frankly, deserve. Um, we've been on that path. We've had success in doing that. And I have to be uh, honest and say, we're still on that path. We are still moving forward. But the results have been, I think, very, very good. And, and we hold them up to the mirror again to our, to our staff to say, here's how we're doing. And the fact of the matter is, we gained 10 percentage points in customer surveys in terms of people rating us excellent in a 12-month period. That doesn't mean everybody rated us excellent. But 10 percentage point change in 12 months means we're on the right track. Uh, we were, um, we were uh, judged to be the safest hospital in D.C. by um, uh, Consumer Reports in the fall of 2013. And we've done nothing but increase those uh, you know, particular scores. So when we talk to the patients now and we hear things, we hear things like, UMC saved my life. And I want other people to know that so that they'll take advantage of that and, and be saved as well. Excellent. That's extremely gratifying, and we hope to continue with that path. Well, thanks so much. It sounds like good news for Ward 7 and 8 and for the city. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me here. Appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today, but thanks to our guests and thanks to you at home for watching. We'll see you again next time.